All right, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for the NAFA SNAPA Annual Convention Special Presentation, A Message to Pharmacy Leaders of Today and Tomorrow. My name is Dr. Ryan Marable, President of the National Pharmaceutical Association, and I will be your host today. We have brought to you a true champion within the global business and healthcare community, Walgreens Boots Alliance CEO, Ms. Rosalind Brewer. She has a very impressive resume. Before becoming CEO of Walgreens, she served as COO of Starbucks, and before that, as CEO of Sam's Club. Additionally, she has served in various senior and executive level roles with Walmart and Kimberly Clark. In her role with Walgreens, she has provided strategically guided innovative leadership for business and pharmacy professionals during the COVID-19 pandemic. She has also been a strong advocate for DE&I initiatives. With that being said, I would like to welcome our guest of honor, Ms. Rosalind Brewer. Ros, welcome to NAFA and SNAFA. Thank you, Dr. Maribel. I'm really glad we could spend this time together. Absolutely. So let's just jump right into it. So with regards to you know, where, where you are in your career. So many people may hear about the advancements and the achievements that you've been able to accomplish over your career, but sometimes that can be overlooked as to how that, how you actually got there. So if you could just take us back to some of the earlier days and some of those early lessons that you experienced that helped shape you to be prepared to where you are today. Great. So first of all, Dr. Marable, um, I think, you know, if you go back into my career and my experiences, it all started um, while I was at Spelman College and I was a chemistry major there and uh, probably always had uh, what I'll call as a bend towards the math and sciences, even in elementary, junior high, high school. So all I ever knew were the sciences. So when I finished Spelman, I jumped right into uh, research and development role with Kimberly Clark because it was my comfort zone. Uh, but I immediately realized that, you know, bench chemistry, which I did for about four or five years, uh, didn't really speak to the other part of me, my personality, my willingness and desire to be uh, around people interacting. And so I expressed that concern to my first employer, Kimberly Clark. And uh, they actually um, helped me see my way through to a role where I eventually began to interact with the customer base. And I think it all just started there, right? And so the best in me came out. Um, I think uh, their investment uh, paid forward for both of us. I learned a lot. I worked in mergers and acquisitions for them. And then I worked on some of the more customer facing teams and eventually ran a very large entity for them and became um, a president of that company. Um, after about 20 years. So I, I spent really a good part of my career at Kimberly Clark. Um, but then I tell you too, you know, in terms of progressing to where I am now, I always describe my careers. I've had the smallest of jobs and I've had the largest of jobs. And then there's uh, a bumpy line in between those two. And um, I will say sometimes I've been given those small jobs because, you know, out of me wanting to learn something new. And then sometimes it's been a challenge. Absolutely. And you touched on a, a really important point with regards to your time at Spelman. Uh, so in pharmacy, and specific to our organization, MPHA and SNAFA, uh, about 65 to 75% of all Black pharmacists in this nation are product of HBCU education. So could you just tell us maybe a little bit about how your HBCU experience Mm -hmm. prepared you for, you know, where you are today? Yes. You know, I contribute much of my success to my experience at Spelman. You know, I left Detroit, Michigan, um, youngest of five, and I was the first one to go away to school. Uh, most of my family went to school in the state of Michigan. Um, and I'll even mention my sister, she went to Wayne State's pharmacy school. So my sister is a pharmacist. Um, and so, you know, I will tell you that being at Spelman, a historically black college, um, all women's institution really taught me a lot about myself. I was amongst people who looked like me, who had a similar background as, as myself, but then it was all about the faculty and staff at that school. 
because I felt like they really had a strong concerted effort in seeing me be successful. And as, you know, as a college student, you'll go through trials and tribulations, but you want that one person or two people to pull you through. So as a college student, I faced the loss of my, my dad. Um, I faced the fun part of pledging my sorority while I was taking calculus, physics, and organic chemistry and hoping that my uh, professors <laughs> would applaud me for uh, joining one of the divine nine. Um, and uh, they saw me through that as well. Um, but also to just being around um, people who held me at what I would say at a very high um, expectation level. And I think that made me do my best while I was in school because of the environment that I was in. Absolutely. I, I know just a little bit about that uh, fraternal and sororal uh, spirit. So it's definitely very exciting to hear about those times uh, when you uh, went through. Uh, yeah. So with that being said, we have many of our student learners uh, who are going to be present and, and viewing this uh, special presentation. So just tell us a little bit about maybe the importance of continuing to learn and always being a student of your craft and being a lifelong sure. learner. Sure. You know, um, I uh, like this discussion in particular, Dr. Marable, because I think it has been what I would say um, one of the um, very strong themes in my career because I have had opportunities to self-develop. And I think I, I look for this in the way I hire people is how agile of a learner are you? Because the business around you will absolutely change, right? You will be faced with a transformative condition in your business. So the ability for you to be an agile learner is very important. So continuous learning, um, self-development, um, looking around the corner, seeing what's next after what's next and trying to propel yourself there, I think is really important. Um, and it's important to us as, you know, minorities in the workplace, because there are going to be times when maybe you're not thought of as the next candidate, not the number one, not maybe the number two, but self-preparation gets you closer to that position and also eliminates those barriers and those thought processes. So, you know, I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, I had been with Kimberly Clark for Oh, it was probably, you know, a good, greater than 10 years. Um, I had a degree in chemistry. I did not have an MBA. I didn't have time for an MBA. I um, had my uh, first child by then. And I really needed to get uh, deep in my abilities around finance and actually the work I was doing in M&A. And so I raised my hand with the support of the company to attend the Wharton Advanced Management Program. Now, it took me out of my position. I was in a key role at the time. I had to reassign all my responsibilities and I took what was called a sabbatical from um, through the summer um, of uh, 2000. And when I did that, it was really interesting to see how much advancement and how I was perceived differently because I did that. Now, I was right on the cusp of getting that next job. I knew if I stepped away, I'd put that at risk. Um, and in fact, what I thought was my next opportunity did get filled while I was away. But then if I, you know, keeping my eyes on the long view, it really paid forward for the long view. So I gave up a little bit in the short term, but I gained a lot in the long view because I was much stronger um, with my uh, financial capabilities. So it's those kinds of things where you sometimes you have to take control of that, self-develop and make sacrifices uh, to, um, to learn more and, and be engaged and think about what's next for yourself. Absolutely, thank you, thank you for that. So let's just take a quick moment to switch gears just a bit. So over these past maybe two years, two or three years, many institu institutions have begun to recognize the impact of systemic racism as it relates to furthering health disparities in communities of color. What are your thoughts on incorporating meaningful DEI strategies to move the needle in efforts to break down these disparities in health? Yes, so you know that's part of the reason why I made the decision to leave the coffee business and come into healthcare and actually regenerate some of the work that I had learned running Sam's Club and Walmart stores, which had retail pharmacies in, in those buildings, um, in addition to the healthcare work I did at Kimberly Clark. Uh, it was because of what was happening 
with vaccine administration, first of all, uh, the lack of confidence by uh, minority communities in vaccinations, right? Because we all know what history has uh, taught us about that in terms of, you know, the whole feeling of being a peach tree dish, right? And being a, a test candidate. Um, and so I felt like I had an opportunity to uh, set an example, uh, get behind something really important for minority communities and health. And I thought that with this pandemic, it was a crisis that could you know, bring those two together. And so joining uh, this company, I joined about 30 days before vaccine administration started. Uh, we had an opportunity to go into communities, a very unique opportunity because of the where our stores are located. And most of, I would say 40 to 50% of our stores are in medically underserved communities. And then we had the opportunity to go mobile. And uh, I felt like if I jumped in now, I could have an impact on that. Uh, but this team was, uh, they were ready. They were, uh, you know, really um, in tune to make that happen. We set up mobile units. Uh, we used interfaith relationships to, um, you know, engage the, the black community and black uh, faith uh, community around why vaccines are important, why it saves lives. Um, and, you know, the outcomes have been tremendous. We were able to really reach the populations that were sitting on the sidelines. Uh, but I think it's going to take more um, of those kinds of instances, hopefully outside of a pandemic, to really stress the importance of localized health care, getting health, providing access to health care, being in the communities and being respected. And I will tell you the pharmacists of this company of Walgreens are well respected in the community and they're usually, and that's probably even outside of, of Walgreens, although I'm, I'm kind of favorite here to, to Walgreens, but I think, you know, we're the first point of contact uh, for, you know, anyone at risk. Uh, they will call a pharmacist before, sometimes they call their primary care physician. So I just think that this, arrangement of having the pharmacist be a pillar in the community and being that first voice to call is important to minority communities where there's sometimes limited access. So, you know, it's part of our strategy here at Walgreens Boots Alliance is to localize healthcare, provide accessibility, and actually create a continuum of care. I will say one other thing is that, you know, you've heard us maybe talk about um, what we're doing with our village MD units with bringing primary care physicians into our buildings. We'll have a thousand of those and they will be, you know, relationships built strongly upon the relationship the pharmacist has already built in the community. And so that's bringing healthcare plus the pharmacy relationship, both the data and the patient uh, contact and relationship closer to the communities that matter to most of us on this call today. That is awesome. We, we, as pharmacists and students of pharmacy, we love to hear that and being able to advocate for the pharmacists to, to practice at the top of their license. So just, just right, along, right along those lines, uh, you mentioned you know, that localized uh, healthcare. So with Walgreens being within about five miles of a, a high majority of our nation's households, uh, what are your thoughts on being able to leverage uh, the, the ability for pharmacists to be able to, to utilize their expertise and their experiences with counseling and, and coaching our patients within their respective communities that, they're, that they serve and maybe some of the innovative strategies yes. that you're putting in place to, to get that job done. So there's a few things we're doing here at, at Walgreens. Let me first start by saying that, you know, um, operating at the top of your license is, is not only important to you all because you've invested in yourselves and you, you know, your degree, credentialed, experienced, everything. Um, but I think there's another part of this where we need uh, legislative change. And so I've been working really hard with our government relations team here at Walgreens. I've spent uh, quite a bit of time in Washington trying to make sure that we can secure provider status for pharmacists. And um, it's a constant drumbeat for me every time I get a call from Washington. I don't care if they're calling me about energy controls or anything. I finish with my last sentence about what about pharmacists, right? And so I am on a constant drumbeat about um, how we can see that um, across the, the United States around provider status. I think that it's going to become critical as we look at more opportunities to test and treat. Let's take you know COVID as a as a, an example. You know the opportunity for you to test in our stores that's readily available now, but then to administer antivirals within you know the seventy two hour window or so that we need to be 
uh, thoughtful about. And then let's talk about your question you served around Dr. Mirabal about being in the community. So just imagine someone in an underserved community that's test positive in one of our stores, and then they have to set up a doctor's appointment to get the antiviral inefficient in so many ways. And so the ability for us to uniformly allow our pharmacists to operate at the top of their license by being able to test and treat and being credited for that is really important. And it's not just with COVID-19 vaccine and antivirals, it's with strep throat, it's with ear infections, it's all of those things where I think uh, the pharmacy community is very well equipped to make those decisions test appropriately and administer. So that's that's one piece of it. I think the second piece in terms of getting um, the pharmacy industry overall to operate at the top of their game is to change the way they work behind the desk. And by that, um, I will share with you that we are developing greater than 22 fulfillment centers across the United States that will take out somewhere between 30 to 50% of our, what I'll call mundane everyday prescriptions out of being filled in the store, send them to Central Field and deliver back to the store already prepared. So, you know, I think about, you know, I mentioned to you earlier that my sister is a pharmacist. You know, I just think about the time that she spends counting pills and I think about what my family paid for her to go to pharmacy school. I mean, it gets really that simple. That's not what, you know, I envision her doing as my big sister, right? You know, and so I think about that and I just say that there's a big brain out there. Um, and also too, I think becoming a pharmacist is a deliberate choice. You're not choosing to understand the pharmacy or the pharmacology. You're also choosing to serve the customer. And so if we can take that mundane work away from the pharmacist and allow you to stand tall behind that desk and behind that counter and really interact in a very personal way with the customer and the patient, I think um, everybody wins from that opportunity. So I feel that it can come in a couple of different ways and we're really working hard on that here at Walgreens. That is music to many of our pharmacist's ears. We, we definitely love to hear that. Just being able to take out some of those tasks that you know, can just really add to the to the stress and demand of the workday. And it ultimately allows for that pharmacist and the patient to really build that relationship. So that way we can learn as much as possible uh, from that patient to be able to drive, you know, more positive outcomes and to, you know, eliminate some of those barriers to their overall care. In addition to that, just being able to communicate with other healthcare practitioners, yeah. those are all things that can be accomplished with that. So the fact that you're taking that that initiative and having those conversations and being very intentional about that, even, you know, at all the way toward the top in, in, in Washington, D.C., those are all things that are, are strong that will help to make true change, which ultimately affects our patients in the most positive way. So, so thank you Absolutely. for sharing that information. And then right along those lines, just you know, some of the, the, the challenges and, and burdens that have been placed on, on the pharmacist. So this, this pandemic presented an opportunity for pharmacists to really engage with communities and with patients. However, it also put pharmacists in a position to really just almost to the point of being burned out. Yeah. So I just wanted to get some of your thoughts and your, some of the things that you may have been able to implement to assist in preventing burnout amongst healthcare practitioners, most specifically with pharmacists? Yes. Um, so Dr. Maribel, I will tell you that I have thought about this so much, you know, I don't know how we could ever, ever, ever repay um, our pharmacists for the sacrifices they made both personally and professionally to be right on the front line and work all of, you know, the issues that were happening at the time. So much was changing right in front of them. And, uh, and they perform superbly. Um, but one of the things that we're doing is to make sure that, you know, we give them, you know, the right, the proper breaks away from, from the counter. Um, one of the, you know, sounds like a small task, but for instance, you know, let's say our pharmacy is due to close at seven o'clock. Well, usually if a pharmacist, if pharmacy closes at seven, there's another hour of paperwork after that, right? And so what we did was adjust the hours so that hour of paperwork, you know, pull the customer away a little bit earlier and give them time to do that where they're not balancing, talking to the customer and trying to close down the counter at the same time. And it's those small things like that, that, you know, we were um, like for myself, I would go stand in the pharmacy and just watch some of what I'll call the crazy that happens during the time of the pandemic. And there were some issues that I'm not quite sure 
many of us could have handled, they did it. And um, it impressed upon me that we have some really strong clinical pharmacists that um, you know, really require uh, the ability to operate at the top of their license. And so what it did for me was to take those learnings back and push even harder to give them better jobs in the future. And so I think it's about what's gonna happen in the future for their roles because they learned a lot and so did we. And I think that, um, you know, just being um, knowledgeable about the hard tasks that they have and adjusting those in the future is going to make all the difference for them. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing that information. So just to transition, I did want to provide just a few things that we could maybe learn about you that might not be what is most pronounced uh, when individuals are learning about who is Roz Brewer. So this is going to be more of a lightning round presentation. So sure. here we go. Let's jump right into it. So some okay. people say that music heals the soul. So if you could share with us, what's your favorite music that's in your playlist right now? Oh, gosh. Um, I am a huge fan of Mary J. Blige. So I just went to her concert early in May, um, stayed from the beginning to the end, lost my voice, stood in my seat. So I, I love everything about Mary J. Um, but then I, I like a lot of music. First and foremost, um, being from the Detroit area, I simply love music. And so it's, it is music to, uh, to the soul. And it is something that I use really, for example, when I'm leaving the office, I have to listen to music just to bring me down a little bit and get into my family life. So it's, it's been a tool for me throughout my entire life. Absolutely. Yes. With our two organizations, MPHA and SNAPA, um, we have a very family oriented vibe. So music is oftentimes one of the things that bring us together. So it's great to hear that. That is something that's important to you as well. So my next lightning round question will be, can you explain the importance of mentoring? Yeah. So, you know, I've been a mentee in my life. And so there's been someone who's uh, looked over my shoulder, uh, redirected me, uh, smacked the back of my hand, uh, the whole works. Um, but the importance of mentoring actually starts with the mentee uh, being a good listener and, and also being um, engaged in part of the process. You know, a, a strong mentee uh, controls uh, the relationship between the mentee and the mentor being very deliberate, intentional about what their needs and concerns are and being open and honest about it um, and being aware and taking feedback effectively. So a lot of that responsibility falls on the mentee um, it, because sometimes I've even looked back on conversations I've had and realized, didn't realize the golden nugget until way after that conversation was held. Sometimes I walk away and say, eh, okay, Later on, man, I have to reach back and say, you know what, he told me that so long ago and I wasn't listening. So I also think, you know, listening, self-awareness, being willing to change and adapt is really important. But then as a mentor, I think for me, what I've tried to do is to be very deliberate and intentional on my part. And so um, I, um, at one point I was mentoring too many people. I cr began to create uh, mentoring circles so that individuals could you know, learn from each other as well as from me because I could scale and reach more people. Um, and then uh, in later years, I've been more deliberate about not only mentoring, but also being a sponsor for some of the talent that, I, that wasn't in my direct control, maybe outside my company within the industry and being very intentional about helping them you know, maneuver their career. Excellent, excellent. Yes, we have a very strong component of our two organizations uh, with regards to mentoring. So hearing that information as relates to, you know, taking the initiative as a mentee, but also um, making it a, a strong responsibility for a mentor uh, is very valuable. So thank you for sharing that information. So we'll transition to vacationing. So oh, wow. when you go on vacation as the CEO, um, many times one would want to bring work with them because, you know, work doesn't stop, but, in your thoughts, um, do you bring work with you? Uh, do you table it or 
do you uh, leave it at home? Oh, well, you know, um, I don't bring work with me. It's, it tends to follow me, <laughs> if that makes sense. Uh, so um, it's never my intention, but I will tell you, it's absolutely my reality. So, but, you know, it's all about having, um, you know, a, a good family uh, discussion around you. You know, my family, uh, we try to get away as much as we can. And we sort of have an agreement, you know, I'm an early riser, so I'll get up in the morning. And just to give you an example, you know, six, six 30 in the morning, the family is conked out on a vacation. And so I can get a lot done in those morning hours, but by afternoon it's, you know, they lay down the, the gauntlet and they let me know, you know, by lunchtime, I'm all there. So we just have an agreement because unfortunately you can't walk away from it. Uh, I'll tell you the mountain would be too high when I <laughs> return from vacation if I totally left it behind. 500 to 1,000 emails. Exactly. A few days, it's, it's, it is the reality. So yes, hearing about that work-life balance uh, is, is definitely very important for us. So thank you for sharing that. Our next question is, our theme for this year is harvesting our history. That is our official 2022, 2022 conference theme. So when you hear the word legacy, what does that mean to you? Hmm. Well, for me personally, um, legacy, it, I think about it, you know, I've been thinking about it more than ever, but I think about how important my personal integrity is because if I thought about my personal legacy, I think that's what I want to leave behind is the integrity that I uh, surrounded myself with when I made some of the toughest decisions. One of the things I impress upon my teams is, you know, make the right decision when no one's watching, right? And, uh, you know, that allows you to put these influences out of your mind. Um, There'll be times where you're faced with what's good for you versus what's good for the organization and the shareholder. And I remind myself constantly, what is my role? And my role here is to represent the team members of this company first and our shareholders as well. And it's not about Roz. And every time I make that decision, I'm usually in that 90% right market. I feel good about that. I I sleep pretty well um, if I've used that as my filter. So I think about legacy for myself and I think about the integrity that I want people to say, Roz Brewer, high integrity. Yes, that definitely resonated with me, representing uh, what's right when no one's watching, a true sign of character. So thank you for sharing that. So Roz, thank you so much for sharing this information with us. I'm gonna leave out on just one last note to for you to just to provide maybe your outlook on what do you view healthcare specifically with WBA by 2030? And we'll close out. Sure, by 2030. You know, we have been talking about our vision for this company, and it's about building more joyful lives and representing a strong position around health and well being for all. And when we say for all, we mean really bringing health care to people who need it the most um, in a way that they have transparency, they have control of their health, uh, they are clear on what their needs are. And so, and it also embraces localizing healthcare and personalizing it. And so when I look out into 2030, I see Walgreens standing for a very strong healthcare concentration in this country, one that moves far away from uh, dispensing uh, to providing access to healthcare and moving really close to provider status. So I'm excited about what healthcare could look like in this country in 2030. I hope Walgreens can play a strong role in that. We're trying to move legislation as much as we can where it matters the most, and then doing the right thing for the customer and patient in the communities that need us. Thank you. Thank you so much. So Ross, just I want to express my true appreciation for everything that you've been able to share with us today. Uh, also to the entire Walgreens Boots Alliance company for uh, just providing us with the time and assisting us and giving us that information, that boost that can carry us as pharmacists and students of pharmacy into the future. So that way, when 2030 comes around, we're able to continue to break down those barriers and increase access and quality of care for the patients and underserved and represented populations that Uh, we serve. So thank you once again. And to our audience, thank you for your attention during today's special presentation. Uh, We hope you're able to learn 
a lot from this presentation and we look forward to engaging with you very soon. So enjoy your conference and we look forward to seeing you very soon. Take care, everyone.